Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Kia ora, Catherine. Konnichiwa, Jane. Wow, it's December. I know. What happened? What the happened whole year has year? gone massively fast. I cannot believe it. And what a year it has been. I think we'll do a little summary next episode and our last episode for this year. But it's December. What is happening in Japan at this time of the year? Well, it's really funny because I was just in an elevator or lift before um, getting online here. And there were a couple of chaps in their suits and they had these two big boxes holding on to them. And I pushed the elevator, you know, the floor they wanted to go to. And they, the boxes were full of calendars ah. all rolled up, looking like rolls of sushi before you cut them. Yeah. And I said, ah, it's calendar delivery season, isn't it? And they went, yes, yes, yes. They're so excited to be delivering calendars really? in the building. <laughs> so were they, were they, what were they from though? Like what were, well, I think the young chaps, well, the building I was in, there is a couple of financial uh, places inside there. So I think they are either with the finance company delivering them to that company in order to then distribute to clients oh, okay. is what I think it is. Because when I came back down, I joined them on the way down and they didn't have the boxes. Okay. So I think they must have delivered them off to the, the bank mm -hmm. uh, for the bank to give to clients, customers. Oh, so that was, yeah, I'd forgotten about that custom in Japan until mm. I saw them right in front of me. Mm. Yeah, we usually get one from the house maker, even though we built our house 13 years ago. That's one from nice. The car dealership where we bought our car from. One from the food delivery service, which comes and delivers us meals <laughs> to our house. One from the airline that we are shareholders in. Um, yeah, various wow. calendars. And none of them are any good, though. None of them are actually useful calendars. The best calendar. Wow. That I yeah. have come across, I always ask my parents-in-law, do you have any calendars with big squares for writing lots of information in? And Absolutely. they always have a great selection because they get even more calendars than we do. And there's a particular <laughs> doctor surgery near their house that they obviously go to that every year gives them a calendar for some reason. And so I'm like, have you got any more of those calendars from the doctor's surgery? That is my favorite calendar. Wow. That's really cool. I mean, I think you're right with the spacing there. I remember when back in New Zealand, I used to get a calendar from the consular office of Japan every year. It was an Ikebana calendar, perhaps 30 centimeters wide. I'm thinking maybe even a bit more. Huge squares. Yeah. So you could write so anything. So useful when there are Very few people useful. for us, like what's everybody doing kind of thing. So, yes, those are my favorite kind of calendars so. <laughs> but is, you yeah. get so many you don't know where to put them there's only so many places you can put up a calendar right exactly. and you end up putting them in the bathroom or just inside the bathroom or outside the bathroom it's like why am I putting it here but you need to sort of use them and I don't like to throw them out either but hmm. perhaps we can think of innovative ways to use them the back of them maybe this exactly. year exactly <laughs> the back of them always ends up as art paper at our house yeah. so yeah. yes very good. nice big sheets of art paper for people to make works of art in. So, so I do yeah, love it's... Japanese calendars in general and I love their diaries and go mad yeah. on that sort of thing. Uh, it's a really fun thing in Japan. I take a few back home when What's I go back diary? and I usually get a reciprocal Kiwiana calendar back to me. So that's always fun. Mm. This yeah. is my chosen Japanese diary, a point. A point? A point diary. Well, this is mine. Yeah. It's always silver. It's the desk planner. Oh. <laughs> My, if anyone wants to know which one it is, we'll put the links in the bios, but I really I like mine. One. I get one every year, even though they're very boring and black looking. They look quite good lined up on my bookshelf. All, All right. right. Anyway, well, that's enough talking about calendars and planners. So who have we got on the show this week, Catherine? I think a perfect guest for the end of year with beverages and celebration, Joe Harawira from Te Wai Manuka. It's a sparkling beverage made of manuka honey and a few other things which we'll let you know about on the episode awesome chat that we had with him absolutely awesome such a lot of fun you'll see and hear us just absolutely enjoying this episode yeah, uh, great time. thank you joe so much for your well first time on a podcast but you aced it and we had so much fun i don't know how we're going to live beyond this because it was so <laughs> good gonna, how are we going to do this <laughs> what a boss let's hear from joe 
Kia ora, Joe. Welcome to the Journals in Japan podcast. Great to have you on the show. Kia ora, Jane and Catherine. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. So our warm-up question for you is, what's a beverage from Japan you have tried or would like to try? Oh, my go-to before like working out every morning is to have one of the, the boss uh, long black coffees. Like oh, yes. The caffeine, cold, brilliant idea. I love it. A can of Boss Black, no yep. sugar, no sugar coffee. No sugar. No, yeah. it's like ah, wow, that's cool. And I heard you can actually buy that in New Zealand now. Is that right? Is the rumor correct? Yeah, totally. That's that's what I buy before doing the workout in the morning. <gasps> Even in New with... Zealand, you, you use that. Wow, cool. It's like it's like seriously uh, growing in the country. It's like um, it's quite impressive the rate of growth. And you said cold, so you like it cold. Yeah, I've never tried. Uh, cold coffee Ooh. before having a boss uh but now that i've had a boss um, i'm hooked on it just just one in the morning i do i do like a hot coffee as well so <laughs> i love the name boss it always makes yeah, me feel like, like the boss. boss at the beginning of yeah. the day and i actually because i know jane's going to ask me this question i go for that one as well because lately i've been doing a lot of early morning business trips and it's been the one i've gone for but a hot one i have to say so they sell it in japan at the on the platform just before you get into onto the train at one of the little shops and they also sell it in the vending machine so that's what i go for yeah you can choose hot or cold yeah i love I that i don't really like my canned coffee warm though i'm yeah mm. no prefer it cold yeah i would say a black canned coffee yeah. <laughs> here we go <laughs> we're all on the my, i'm a tully's i'm a tully's girl i think oh. I well, might have to give the boss a try, though. I give it another go now. I might it's, like it. It's, it's so interesting can... how our tastes and our um, preferences change. Because mm. if you would have said to me, "Oh, there's this canned cold coffee coming up," I would have like, mm, "Yeah, no, not for me." Yeah, no, yeah. not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you've had one today, have you, Joe? Already. I've had two. <laughs> oh, you've had two? Well, there you go. Well, we're thrilled to have you on the Jandals in Japan podcast. And we've heard it's your first podcast ever. And so we're delighted that you're spending your first opportunity experience with us. Well, you are the co-founder and managing director of Wai Manuka, New Zealand's premium non-alcoholic beverage, not a boss coffee, right? Made throughout the global pandemic. We can't wait to hear this story from you because you're now exporting into Tokyo. And we love that. That is another New Zealand product on the stage here. We'll put your full bio into the show notes later. But tell us this inside story. How did you come up with this creation and then eventually bring it to the land of the rising sun? So tell us first about how you came up with this idea. Yeah, the, the whole journey, to be honest, has been really surreal. So I uh, started um, Waimanuka with myself and two good friends, and none of us came from a um, FMCG background or, or beverage manufacturing background. But what essentially happened was, uh, like all big, great business ideas, it started off as a New Year's Eve conversation, uh, sitting around a barbecue. And that particular night, I was, I was drinking uh, pineapple kombucha, so I wasn't drinking alcohol. And I was really disappointed because it, it tasted nothing like pineapple. And I remember saying to everyone at the party, like, oh, this is terrible. Somebody's got to make it a better premium uh, non-alcoholic non alternative. And we started throwing around ideas. And we actually knew right from day one that this was going to be an export product. Firstly, it needed to uh, address the immediate problem of being a great tasting beverage, which the kombucha wasn't. Secondly, because it was going to be an export product, we wanted it to kind of like uh, write off the momentum and the reputation of some of our most kind of loved brands, which is Manuka Honey, you know, the Manuka Honey story. So then when we knew we were going to add Manuka Honey as an ingredient, and this is all happening at a New Year's Eve party. So everyone's like, just suddenly. I've got, the image. Yeah, I've got yeah. the image. What's playing on the music? I want to know what's playing on the music. <laughs> I think at that stage, because it was quite early, it was just some old school kind of um, New Zealand reggae. Great. I've got but the vibe now. I've got the yeah, image. Yeah, yep. yeah. And then the party actually, like, it came down a few notches so we could engage in this in this important conversation. And what we landed on by the end of the night, and this is like 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to say, is um, taking Manuka honey, combining it with spring water, and we even had a name for it. We are going to call it the healing water of Aotearoa. And then... Um, 
on New Year's Day, so January 1st, I, I woke up and then I did a like bit of desktop research and I realized that nobody's actually making a, a premium Manukahani beverage. And then I messaged the boys and I said, hey, man, no one's making this. Let's do it. And we we're like, yeah, sweet, let's do it. So that was kind of the origin story. <laughs> Whoa, what a cool that's story. That's given me shivers. That's amazing. Yeah, wow. that's why it's been so surreal, like, to go from, like, this idea around a barbecue at New Year's to this thing that people love. I look back and you're just like, wow, what happened? Wow, what was the next step then? You've got this idea, the guy's all behind you. What did you do next? Yeah, so the next was we we needed to um, find the right people to help sort of um, create the recipe and that we, we tried to do it ourselves and we made it out of a, um, we had a guy making it out of a uh, soda stream uh, machine. But it's just, <laughs> it this is classic so, Kiwi. Oh my goodness. The number, the number AY mentality didn't work that time. Mm. Uh, and then we were kind of like, well, we need to get some experts now to help us out. So uh, we managed to find a beverage technician through our networks and Again, the, the, the story takes on another level of, of um, surrealness, if that's a word, uh, when, when lockdown hit. And that period actually gave us the, the time and the space to find the right people to build the business, to develop the recipe. And coming out of COVID, the middle of the year, 2020, we had this final recipe and we hadn't done a production run yet, but towards the back end, a, a mentor forwarded through an expression of interest for the America's Cup. So at the end of that year, um, late 2020, early 2021, the 36 Americans Cup was taking part in the Auckland of the Viaduct, um, you know, prestigious yachting mm -hmm. event, one of the oldest um, sporting events in the world type thing. And they were looking for food and beverage to that best represented New Zealand to be showcased on this global stage. And my mentor said, you know, man, it, it's way too early for you, but this is just an example of some of the opportunities that are out there. And I just wanted to share it. And myself and the lads, we, we looked at the criteria for it and we were like, oh, man, let's just give it a go. Uh, and then we got invited to a panel interview by the food and beverage staff from America's Cup and actually thought I bombed it. So, like, I came out of that feeling like, oh, well, on to the next thing. It's not going to happen. And then a couple of weeks later, they, um, the, the head of uh, food and beverage for America's Cup uh, phones me up and says, Radio, uh, we've selected six brands to represent New Zealand for the America's Cup. Four of them are alcoholic and two of them are non-alcoholic. We're selecting Coke and you. <gasps> Way to go. Hey. Oh, my goodness. So, Coke and wow. you. <laughs> yeah. So that was our launch to market was, uh, was the America's Cup. And um, at the stage, we hadn't actually... I don't even know. I'm probably not even allowed to say this. We hadn't even made the product at that point, but um, mm -hmm. they still took us on board based on the story, the alignment of values and that type of thing. Amazing. So obviously that went well or you got some, or you learned something from it. So what came out of, of that? I think for us, the best thing that came out of it was the exposure and the profile. So um, off the back of, of securing a, a, a beverage supplying uh, agreement to America's Cup, I remember emailing um, Lucas De Jong from um, Seven Sharp, and I was like, "Hey man, do you guys want to run with a story? Uh, we we just been selected for the America's Cup as a beverage, and we don't even know how to make beverages." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> um, so they said, "Yep, can you guys do a story like uh, this week?" And so um, you know, off the back of the story that Seven Sharp uh, did the end of 2020, I'm going to say. It was second only in terms of viewership to the then Prime Minister uh, Jacinda Ardern's acceptance speech. Like it just went oh off. Oh, my God. Viral. Yeah, it was insane. Hey, so, as they say here in Japan. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was intense. And then we were getting contacted from everyone wanting to stop Waimanuka. Um, and whilst it was really great, we were still, like, really just trying to find our feet. And we, we mm. didn't convert on the opportunity as much as we we probably would have now if it had presented itself so but it was amazing exposure and off the back of that we we secured partnerships with the likes of you know government house for their investiture ceremonies and and lots of high-end um, um outlets and, and events amazing amazing <laughs> stuff absolutely amazing i mean you talked about the story aligning with your values I want to go everywhere, but I want to go back to that because I think I want to know what your values are and what's the story that captured, mm. for example, America's Cup, even when you didn't even have a product. 
what was it that sung to them? For us, it was yeah, obviously the alignment of values. So, so for Wai Manuka as a brand, um, our values are, are based on sort of our, our Maori culture, um, and it's things like Hauratanga, which is you know around health and wellness, Manakitanga, which is about caring and, and respect, uh, Fanonatanga, which is all about building relationships first before engaging in business, and then Kaitiakitanga, which is about caring for the planet. So these, these values that are inherent uh, within Māori culture are a big part of the brand story for Waimanuka. And in a lot of ways, I feel like that's what resonated with the um, panel for America's Cup. That and the fact there's like some guys out of Whakatane that have no industry knowledge or background, and yet they've made this beverage and they've got global aspirations for it. I think that people love the, I guess, the, the authenticity and even a sense of naivety about what you're getting yourself into. Like, wow, man, it's like, it's pretty buzzy. Wow. Yeah. This is a stunning story, honestly, you know, to go from, as you just said, naivety. I was going to say it, but I didn't want to offend you. But you've you've said it right. You went from that situation. You went through America's Cup. What happened next? Come on, tell us some more. Um, yeah. So after America's Cup, we um, we jumped straight onto an export essentials course with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. So that's the, like when we picked up America's Cup, we were in one cafe in Fakatani. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and can you name that cafe please because they should know that you know you're their origin of course they know that but can you name them Let's give them a shout yeah, out it's, uh, it's Nati cafe here in Fakatani. so got a pretty good relationship with the chief executive there and uh just sent her an email and said hey we're making a drink can you put it in the can you put it in the fridge I, I, was, I have to tell you a story about the guy from uh I forgot what his name was but as you can imagine like the industry in New Zealand is really small and um, like all the F&B people from America's Cup know everyone in the beverage industry. They had the big guy from Coke in the office. We weren't there at the time, but he was looking at the list and, of, of beverage suppliers and then he, he he worked down the list and he got to us and he was just like, what is wine manuka? <laughs> <laughs> so, How do I not know about this? Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Is there a jump then from coming to Japan? When did you come into Japan? Um, so we started exporting to Japan uh, in May last year, and really May 22, we yeah yeah yep May twenty two, and that was through an export partnership with Mariri, which is an e commerce store. Uh, one of the co founders, Mayu Suzuki, she's based here in New Zealand uh, in Wellington actually, and um, she had been following the Waimanuka journey. So I think she saw the Simon Sharp video like everyone else in the country. And then she started following it, and then it turned out that her, her customer base in Tokyo were wanting a premium non-alcoholic beverage. So then we went, met with um, Mayu earlier uh, last year just to talk about what a potential partnership might look like. At that stage, we went with Mayu. I think we were in about maybe half a dozen cafes and two supermarkets. So um, we were getting a little bit of traction coming out of um, coming out of America's Cup, but nothing that warranted jumping straight into exports and. In fact, our board, so we've got an advisory board, they they said to us that um, to put it on hold, we're not ready for it. We've got to build out the fundamentals of the business first before we look at exporting as an opportunity. And then I was like, yeah, 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 we'll put it on hold. And yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, yeah. Not. <laughs> so, um, I signed an agreement with <laughs> with um, Mayu and Mariri and we, um, we sent a shipment of product up to Tokyo to be distributed through the e-commerce store. And then I told the board that we're going to tap in. <laughs> Ooh, ask for forgiveness later, the classic. Yeah, totally. Ooh. Well, we love Mayu, one Indeed. of our wonderful guests we have had. And I get the feeling you guys are a great combination, yeah, Perfect. that you work Real. really well together and align very, very well, and that her customers would really value this product as a healthy non-alcoholic beverage here in Japan. If you think, Catherine, like, you know, we have our no alcohol days, the kind of things that are on offer are not that healthy as alternatives. They've already sort of baked sugars or these non-alcoholic beers, but you also wake up feeling seedy the next day, but in a different way, you know, kind of thing. So I think you've got a real opportunity there with this healthy, good for you beverage, right? Yeah, I feel like we've um, 
we've, we've hit the market at the right time. So coming out of COVID, like one of the things that's become really important to people is, is wellness. Um, so people want to have a, an enhanced sense of wellness. They want to be more connected and they're identifying with brands that reflect their values. And that's exactly the customer that we want to be sort of engaging with who that's our one money for customer. And in terms of Mayu, she's actually become uh, like a sister and, and I get on so well with her and her whole family and that and, and just love the relationship that we have. And it's funny because we don't really talk about business a lot. It's more about how your family's doing and friends and what you've been up to. And then the business stuff just takes care of itself. And I think that's one of the things that sort of you've got to come to appreciate if you're looking at doing business in, in Japan is that it's all about relationships and connections. Yeah, how's it going so far, bringing your product into Japan? What feedback have you had? Well, we started exporting in May last year and sales grew by 67%. And that kind of um, led the way for us wanting to do an initial capital raise. Since then, though, we've done a bit more research and, and figured out that actually let, let's treat um, Japan as more of a long-term strategy just because the market is, is so much bigger. Like, I'm still the only full-timer in, in Wainanuka, and so obviously juggling a fair bit and in terms of the the investment both in time money and resource that it would take to to pull off a launch into market it was probably a bit too much to bite off after talking with mayu and obviously our board we've taken a longer term view as to how we grow the brand in, in japan and we're looking at sort of other countries particularly within the southeast asian uh region one of the reasons why it's gone so well though is is really that um i think the alignment of values and focus on long term. There's no such thing as sort of you know get rich quick. I want to get in, get make my money and get out. You you have to build the relationships from the ground up, and they need to trust you and and that type of thing. And I think there's also a lot of synergy between sort of the Japanese and, and Maori culture. So we have like a term you know manakitanga, which which basically means sort of caring for each other and, and respect and. In Japan, I'm probably going to butcher this. They have this saying called omotenashi or something. You or, got it. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, omotenashi. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that means it's similar to manakitanga. And so um, I think because of all these these beautiful sort of cultural and, and emotional kind of nuances that we share, it's just made everything else so much easier. Has anything been a little tricky for you or something that surprised you about coming into Japan? Maybe you had an assumption about it. And it's changed your assumption or just something that was like totally exactly what you thought it was going to be. How about that? I think the biggest thing was because like, you know, from New Zealand, a small country, far away from everyone. The biggest thing was just the sheer size and the complexity of the market and trying to figure out a um, a staged approach to growth and into that market kind of a thing. Like I just, you have no, it's in such a big world out there when you're in New Zealand at the sort of <laughs> Yeah. On the way of bringing out what to do or where to go. And when it comes to exporting, your risks go up sort of threefold in terms of time and cost. So uh, every decision that you make has got to be of a um, of a high standard and a good quality. Otherwise, if you get it wrong, then you know you could you could get hurt. So I think the biggest surprise for me was um, um, yeah, just the size and complexity of the market and what would need to actually penetrate it to grow the brand. Uh, and then that actually kind of led us to looking at sort of other opportunities um, to grow back into Japan. It might not be a, a goal for this year or next year, but in the ne yeah, next five to 10 years, who knows what you guys can achieve. That's amazing. So where can one access your beverages in Japan these days? Is it just through Bariri at the moment or are there other places we can get hold of it here in Japan? Yeah, it's mainly through Bariri, uh, through the website, but we've had some... This is the thing about Waimanaka because it resonates with so many different uh, groups and, and, and types of people. So we've had everyone from like um, politicians through to journalists and sports people and influencers uh, try and love sort of Waimanaka. There was a dinner held at the, um, the Japanese ambassador to New Zealand, um, his residence in, in Wellington earlier this year. And, and the centerpiece of that particular um, dinner event was Waimanaka. And so the um, the Japanese ambassador and, and all of his staff and his wife, uh, they all tried it and loved it. So off the back of these amazing connections that we've been able to establish, we we also had another opportunity to trial it in at the All Blacks versus uh, Japan uh, test match in Tokyo last year. Oh, um, yes. 
Yeah, so New Zealand Rugby were setting up a, um, a Kiwiana VIP type lounge situation in the stadium and they wanted brands that kind of spoke to New Zealand values and they kind of opened the, the door for us and because we had a product in market with Mayu through Maridi, it was easy enough for us to supply. So that enabled us to get Waimanuka into the hands of around 400 sort of uh, VIP guests and, and corporate guests, those types of things. Um, and that gave us some really great exposure. And then there's a, um, a Japanese New Zealand infused restaurant in Tokyo called uh, Rangitoto Tokyo. Ah, which is yes. Here we go. Wayne. Yeah, Wayne. Yeah, Wayne. He quite often serves up uh, Waimanuka to his, to his guests. So there's been a few opportunities outside of the e commerce where we've been able to um, sort of test and learn, I guess, but we, we're not into full on retail uh, just yet. That's so cool. Wow. Look at those connections that you're already, I can see them branching out. I heard that uh, Waimanuka was really a good combination with sushi. Yes. So uh, feedback from uh, for Mayu actually was that um, for her, it is the only beverage that pairs well with sashimi. Um, and wow, there you go. Sashimi. Huh? Yeah. Mm. So we, we also had um, Waimanuka um, tested and reviewed by a wine writer, a wine writer here in New Zealand, her name is Joelle Thompson, and she's quite a, a renowned yep. journalist. She actually gave it a really high rating of 18.5 out of 20, and bearing in mind she only evaluates wines. Um, but then she also spoke to the types of foods that um, Waimanuka would pair well with, and that's a lot of your seafood dishes, um, because the um, the savoury wood notes of the Manuka honey kind of balances out the, the salty kind of uh, seafood taste. So there's a good kind of, uh, I guess, balance there in terms of uh, food pairing, which again opens a whole new door and channel and opportunity for Waimanuka to, to explore. There you go. Wow. What's in the future? Can we ask anything around the corner that you're thinking about that you can talk to us about? Yeah, sure. So um, a short-term goal is really to achieve maturity in the New Zealand market. Mm. Um, and at the same time, we want to test and learn in Singapore. Uh, I was really lucky to be part of a, um, a New Zealand Māori uh, food and beverage trade mission to Singapore earlier this year. And um, there's some amazing, uh, we've formed some amazing connections up there and the opportunity is real because, you know, the population is similar to New Zealand. Uh, it's the size of Lake Topol, essentially. They are very wealthy and discerning consumers. So it would be easy enough for us to, to go up there to launch into market, to build a profile and then use that as a springboard to go into the likes of uh, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, and then back up into, um, into Tokyo. That's like literally probably a seven to nine year plan all of it wow we can't Love wait it. to see you back here though i did follow you on linkedin and other social media when you were doing that tour it looked incredible and there's nothing like it right you must have learned so much being on the ground in these various places oh honestly there is you know you can do all the reading and listen to all the podcasts sorry that um, <laughs> <laughs> you can listen to but Nothing beats being in market and, and experiencing the culture firsthand, trying the different foods and just getting a feel and a sense for what's out there and how your product can fit in this market and uh, make a difference and appeal to the, a certain customer group. Nothing beats it. Mm. So what's your one nugget? What's your one gem nugget of advice you would give to Kiwis planning to export? I would say, man, supply chain is everything. So it's really easy to, to make a product, to have an idea and make a product. It's really hard to distribute it and to sell it. So you've got to make sure that supply chain is, is efficient and you're looking at ways to continuously improve it um, and it's low touch because you know, there's a lot of water between us and everyone else. So you're always going to pay a premium to get your product around the place. So you need a good supply chain and you need an even better a partnership on the ground on the other side representing you in a way that's um, aligned to your values and, and puts your product and brand in the best light. Awesome. We have not had that one yet. Oh, really? Gold. Nobody Absolute has gold. spoken about yeah. the supply chain. You hit it. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, we hit supply chain pains here in New Zealand. So, like, I mean, mm. wow, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it could almost be so obvious that people don't talk about it, but thank you for saying that because that's, mm. that is actually so critical right now. If you haven't got that worked out, it's going to yeah, be a bit of a... Yeah, if you can't 
guarantee your supply you are going to lose your customers in japan very quickly if you yeah you yeah and can't to be fair, we, what we you promise really, yeah to be fair we, we had a pretty amazing kind of event that, that taught us the hard way or taught everyone the hard way and that was covid so off the back of covid there were bottlenecks all over the world there was like the shipping times were taking way longer, therefore the costs had gone up. So we came through this. For us, we were fortunate at a time uh, to come through it when we we're still learning and finding our feet in, you know, our, like like export probably makes up about 15% of our total revenue. So it wasn't it wasn't a big strain on the business kind of a thing. And uh, so we had the time, I guess, to, to learn from others where others have made mistakes and be able to pivot and kind of refine our strategy. So... Great. Any activities or promotions you've got coming up, maybe specific to Japan or in general? Uh, in general, it's really around the, the build up to Christmas. Right. So we want to um, ensure that uh, there's people up and down the country that are uh, including Waimanaka on the Christmas table. So we're about to do a collab with a local influencer. Um, and in Japan, uh, it'll be more around working with Mayu and what she sees fit and when kind of a thing. It's really great because they take care of all of that for us. And, you know, we supply them with the collateral and then they change the language and the tone and everything. So mm -hmm. it's the, the Japanese market and then they they roll it into these sort of targeted campaigns throughout the year. So in terms of like, like people talk about how difficult exporting is. Well, it's actually it's actually pretty easy with my even. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, right partner you. can be fun and easy and a beautiful relationship yeah. as well. You've got the right partner. There mm. you go. Any final words, Joe, or actually any questions for us as well that you might have? Um, I'd love to get an understanding on, on, on Kiwi businesses that are doing well over in Japan and why kind of a thing so that we back here can learn. Uh, you know, we're only small in Tokyo right now, but we will be big one day. And it's important that we sort of take on as much insights and feedback as we can from people like yourselves who are on the ground. What makes Kiwi brands and products successful in Japan? Go. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds, go. Yeah, go, right? I mean, it can, also, it can be leveraging the clean, green, beautifulness of New Zealand. But also there are some brands here, and if you look at Zespri, it doesn't even talk about New Zealand mm. on any of its advertising, yet it's the most popular TV commercial in Japan, the, the accessory Kiwi Brothers. So that's focused on wellness. So you could take both ways. It could be that you leverage New Zealand or that you don't, in fact, that you've got a great product that sells itself because everyone's after wellness and that's what they do very, very well. But I think you, you got it already, Joe. Mm. You got it already. You talked about long term. And I think people may have a different maybe definition of what long term means isn't 12 months long term. Mm -mm, right. We've both been here more than 20 years each, you know, 40 years between us and we're still learning. So my biggest thing to advise would be the long term view and building really, really close relationships that you understand people. I loved how you said you talk about family with Mayu. And then the business takes its own little way behind it. You just said it. So I'm going to capture what you said and send it back to you because that's where it's at. Jane, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say the collaboration, because like you said, we are small. We cannot mm. do all of these, you know, things that you're doing as a one man band in New Zealand, try and do all of those as a one man band in Japan. But the collaboration with Mayu in this case is greater than the sum of the two parts right you guys working together become that maths equation that we're supposed to remember so your collaboration is going to be what makes you successful and just not giving up and just keeping going and maintaining that quality maintaining that your integrity yeah maintaining your integrity your quality and the rest will take care of itself when people start to try and realize that you you have this amazing, beautiful, healthy product and they can enjoy it. And have you got a yuzu flavor coming down the line? That was my question. Ooh. Oh, sorry? Yuzu. A version with um, the yuzu fruit in it. Oh. So, you know, that lemony kind of fruit Lemon from Japan called yeah. yuzu. yuzu. Have you heard yeah. of it? No. I imagine you need to check that out. Yeah. Swapping out the lemon that you're using for a yuzu. That would yuzu. be awesome. Actually, 
beautiful combination potentially yeah in terms of uh, new product development we've got like a there's like three pages of ideas that we've got around sort of how it can right. be on the range but um i'll definitely add that to it um because because we, we've always got to be looking for the next thing as well absolutely enjoyed today i think one of our very best episodes um who knew you were a newbie to podcasting because you got you're natural Amazing. So congratulations on being a very successful Jandal in Japan. You can now call yourself a Jandal. And thanks for telling us today about this story and for sharing your tips for success here. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and um, appreciate it. And I'll, I'll definitely take you up on the, or, um, the opportunity to test over there. I'd love to do something with you to get some <laughs> human insights. That'd be brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we'd love to help out where we can and keep in touch. Yeah, let us know if you're over here, etc. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Oh my. I have no further words. I That's think it. that was <laughs> it. Nailed, nailed it. Nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Joe, good on you. Amazing. Values, long term synergies, relationships, community, collaboration, trust, partnerships, you supply chain. <laughs> supply chain. <laughs> Well, now we've just ha- got our own MBA. We have and, from uh, Harawira's <laughs> MBA. Thank you so much, Joe. That was just the magical. We're awesome. going to leave it here because we don't need yep. to say anything more. That was brilliant. All the best for the for your journey and being a massive <laughs> success here in Japan. And we look forward to seeing you here. for listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes this podcast is brought to you today by Catherine o'connell law and pod launch with jane if you have a great story you think should be on the show come and find us on linkedin or instagram we'd love to hear from you see you next time mata ne